what I like to do. I'm with uh, the right kind of people, people who are very friendly, who are quite professional, you know, and the fact that we are impacting lives of other people is also quite uh, fulfilling. In APHRC, I like the teamwork. Want to. And Want to. I also like the fact that we all respect one another and we do everything together. You have a sense of personal development, like you have the opportunity to attend the trainings, webinars, and all that thing makes you develop your skills and a sense of personal development. APHRC is a family. That's why I feel a real pleasure to come at office, meet colleagues, and uh, resolve challenges. I really like the the company, the company culture, and I really appreciate the the fairness, the the respect, the trust, the integrity, uh, the growth um, mindset, the teamwork. And the diversity. Um, APHRC is the is the place to be. One word to describe working at APHRC would be challenging, terrific, dynamic, impactful, been exciting, is inclusive, is brilliant, excellence, uh, is an amazing place. I think one of the things you learn very quickly, and you should learn very quickly, is that you shouldn't fear reaching out to anyone in the institution. Everyone is open and everyone is ready and able to collaborate. APHRC is a center of excellence. We have so many opportunities for us to grow in our different career paths and also as individuals. It's all a matter of what you do with the opportunities that have been presented to you as an individual. Because yes, we are uh, individuals first, but at the same time, we are part of this beautiful success story that is APHRC. Many daycare centers in this informal settlement are home-based, where women uh, sit down and start uh, a daycare center based on the need. This comes with the challenge that uh, most of these daycare owners lack skills and competence to run this daycare center. So the project, the community of practice project aimed to test the feasibility of a model that would improve the quality of daycare centers in this informal settlement. So we've been on this project for the past about three years here in Korogocho and in Biwandani. And our motivation or 
the reason for having started this project is we realized that the quality of child care centers, or you can call them daycare centers, in the informal settlement, or if you want to call them slums, was really poor, and is still poor. So with that in mind, we sat together with the different you know, communities or stakeholders and co-designed an intervention to help you know, improve the quality of these centers through skills building for the center providers. This is an intervention that leverages on the CHV's roles in the communities. So it was delivered by the CHVs who trained the center providers. So we did that for a period of six months where we delivered the four modules. The intervention is feasible. It's possible to have CHVs train the center providers on those modules and the center providers actually picked up the skills. Kasiangu kama CTV huwa na tembelea daycare. Then hii daycare imeipangia kwa masiku naenda daycare kama mbili kwa siku. Ah na nikienda kwa daycare moja huwa nachukua kitu kama 1 hour. Sababu ni ninaangalia vile daycare giver ana anaangalia watoto vile nione kama kwa ile masomo ambao walifundishwa kama wanayasika na wanaendelea eh, kulingana na vile walifundishwa tumefundishwa na EPHRC ambao walitutembelea tu na nikanufaika kukuwa mmoja wa kuchaguliwa dekia yangu kwenda kwa yale mafunzo na tukafundishwa vitu mingi that is kuweka dekia ikiwa safi kutengeneza learning through play that is kucheza na watoto tulifundishwa mambo ya first aid na tangu wakati ule naweza sema nilitisikia sana ya kwamba hii si kazi tunafanya but pia ni kazi ya maana kwangu so we think that if this intervention or model is integrated fully into the health system with the CHVs delivering it and the child supporting them and then um, having the sessions in the groups that would really work so well for not just Nairobi but we think that the entire country wherever there is an informal daycare. So most of uh, this horoboto location there is a very high rate of poverty and uh, most of the uh, women here are single mothers and uh, they go out to look for money. Some go to Dandora Dam site. So when they go, they have to leave children in the daycares. Most of this daycare, we have people who are well-trained on the daycare. So it's very, very important because basically, uh, the children from, uh, from, this, from very young tender age, how you bring them up matters. So to us here, it is very, very important. We are currently in the era of the big four agenda. And big four means a uh, uh, universal help. It means uh, affordable housing, manufacturing, and lastly, uh, issues to do with uh, food security. So when your organization has come in and you know, and, uh, the focus on the issues to do with uh, the health, you're really contributing a lot to the GDP of this country. This project is important because uh, we live in, in the urban in the cities where uh, child care would become a challenge if there were no child care centers. Because we know that currently a lot of women have to engage in employment to be able to fend for their families. Mimi, if you have to afford the main for size, for Patriangu Badi Kochini, so I mean, I prefer daycare. You made the last one was here, Pesa Mingi, and Bado Sina Fikia Hapo. So that daycare and this idea can be Sarapisa. Imekuwa nikileta mtoto huku hivi baby care kwa sababu huku ndio nilisikia kuna huduma mzuri ambapo mtoto akikaa na jinsi hata mimi mwenyewe ama na mama yake mahali alipo anafanya kazi ako safe. Food 
food is a very basic need for everyone. If you don't have food, then you don't feel secure. The Zero Hunger Initiative is an initiative that was born out of a vision that we have for 2050 to restore Nairobi to a place of cool waters that is food secure, healthy and environmentally friendly and where people live in harmony and peace. How we hope to achieve the vision and the Zero Hunger Initiative is through different projects that address the different objectives that we have for the vision and the Zero Hunger Initiative. We have several strategies. One is agroecological urban farming. We want to promote that. At the moment, we are running a project called Healthy Food Africa. Healthy Food Africa project is part of a, a, a wider project, which is under Horizon 2020 uh, under the European Union. One project is in Kisumu and the other project is in Nairobi. So in Nairobi, we are establishing a food systems lab. We want to try out the innovative agroecological urban farming and also um, a food safety component. And uh, we have been building the capacity of the youth groups and women groups. We are training them, working with some grassroots organizations that have uh, experience in training people on agroecological urban farming. And then we are giving them inputs and some financial support to be able to do the farming. farming. Lakini sisi before tulikuwa tumeona tu rabbit keeping na na poultry. So tukienda pale Ruben Center tena tukaanza kuona hii watu wanalima, kuna mboga zimepanda in different structures. Unapata vitu kaa cones zimesetiwa pale, kuna pallet gardening, wako wengi na aquarium hapo. Na ni kasi space tu, ni space wame utilize tena mzuri sana. So tukasema hapana. Hii kitu hata sisi tunaza jaribu. But even with those within the women and youth groups, they are also uh, uh, diverse. We have uh, we have uh, like uh, pe people with di disability are part of those groups, and then we also have um, uh, so, uh, community media, a group that is that is uh, involved with community media. David toka IPHC, na pia toka Greg ambaye metoka City Shamba. Kumbuka hi tunaifanya ndi posta tuweze ku empower each individual in this na wakuna kwa raiti. Objective yetu ya kwanzisha hii mradi haswa CO2 wakuna groups. Tunataka hii ukulima isike kwa mlango ya huwa mwenyewe. After the training, they, just, they chose what they want to do. Some went to crop farming and some went to livestock farming. The crop farming they are they are doing using like vertical methodologies. Others are using like uh, sack gardens. They are able to produce food also vertically. There is one group that chose to do hydroponics. It's a water system where you add nutrients and so people are able to produce food uh, vertically in a small space. So there are there are groups that are doing poultry. This is for for meat but also for eggs. Another aspect of the, um, of the agroecological urban farming is uh, edible landscaping. And we are promoting edible landscaping in schools and in other community spaces, planting trees, fruit trees. But also we want to support kitchen gardens in the schools so that schools can have like vegetables that are healthy and they can use those for the school feeding program. We expect that this has, is going to have impact in terms of access to food for the urban poor communities. And we also want to promote circular bioeconomy in which we want to, to have a food rescue system where food is rescued from where it could go to, to waste and uh, recirculated in the system. We are promoting the spirit of Ubuntu. The, this the concept of uh, I am because we are, we support each other in the community. We share whatever we have. And uh, the food rescue system is based on that concept of Ubuntu. 
And the impact that we are seeking to get from this is the narrative shift of food, from food being seen as a commodity to food being seen as a common good and as a human right. At APHRC, we have a very open culture. We encourage people to speak up. We encourage people to participate in all our processes. And uh, we also encourage uh, people to always think of uh, better ways of doing things. Working at APHRC helps me grow through mentorship because we have a pool of researchers and pool of expertise that we're able to learn from. Um, there's also an on-job training where we're able to improve on our skills that we need um, assistance on. Really, people take different uh, uh, routes to success, but APHRC provides an open. It gives you kind of a blank check for you to, uh, to grow. APHRC has evolved to become an African think tank. Uh, in terms of an institution. But in a sense, if you are to try to look at uh, the caliber of uh, institutions, research institutions in Africa, APHRC is at the very top. We as employees here are given an opportunity to voice our concerns and be part of the decision-making process. It's something that I honestly don't take for granted. I love working at APHRC because it offers me an opportunity to work with different people to learn different things. I'm very big on making myself better on a day-to-day, month-by-month, year-on-year. I should. I, I believe that you shouldn't go into an organization and leave it the same way that you came in. I mean, what's the point? It is about people, transforming lives of people, something that's quite uh, top in my value system. I would say the first thing is conviviality. Yeah, working is like working with a big family. So we have uh, researchers, board staff, uh, data you need, uh, statistician and all that. But we all work like a family. I feel when I'm doing what I like to do, I'm with uh, the right kind of people, people who are very friendly, who are quite professional, you know, and the fact that we are impacting lives of other people is also quite uh, fulfilling. In APHRC, I like the teamwork, and I also like the fact that we all respect one another and we do everything together. You have a sense of personal development, like you have the opportunity to attend the trainings, webinars, and all that thing make you develop your skills and also grow through your career. APHRC is a family. That's why I feel a real pleasure to come at office, meet colleagues, and uh, resolve challenges. I really like the the company, the company culture, and I really appreciate the the fairness, the the respect, the trust, the integrity, uh, the growth um, mindset. The, and the diversity, um, APHRC is the, is the place to be. One word to describe working at APHRC would be challenging. Terrific. Dynamic. Impactful. It's been exciting. It's inclusive. It's brilliant. Excellence. Uh, it's an amazing place. I think one of the things you learn very quickly and you should learn very quickly is that you shouldn't fear reaching out to anyone in the institution. Everyone is open and everyone is ready and able to collaborate. APHRC is the center of excellence. We have so many opportunities for us to grow in our different career paths and also as individuals. It's all a matter of what you do with the opportunities that have been presented to you as an individual. Because yes, we are with our individuals back, but at the same time, we are part of this beautiful 
success story that we gave each other. Okay. So good afternoon and thank you. Uh, good afternoon, thank you so much uh, for finding time to join us today. Uh, we have a very interesting uh, discussion um, on anti-blackness in global health. We have all witnessed uh, challenges and I think it's time for all of us to actually speak about it. And we are so glad to have um, uh, very good uh, speakers who are actually leading global health in the South uh, with uh, Madhupai, who is actually uh, a, a professor in global health and has actually uh, done a lot of research and work on these issues. Uh, we also have uh, Dr. Chobutungi, uh, our very own um, uh, executive director. And of course, we have young people as well, uh, Dr. Marie-Claire Ongari, and we know that the future is young. And uh, of course, Samuel OGOT, who has actually also was one of us at APHRC. Uh, but I also take note that uh, we have uh, Dr. Gizinji from uh, AMREF, um, and, and he's also online, and he will be speaking to us. So to start us off, I will uh, invite uh, Dr. Catherine Chobutungi to uh, give her uh, opening remarks, uh, then to set the agenda for us to actually delve into this issue that is very important, not just for us, but for the rest of the Global South. Thank you, Dr. Chabutu. When you decide to clap, you have to commit. <laughs> Otherwise, the clap will never happen. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome all of you to this event. And I will, I will welcome different people, and I'll start with Martin. <laughs> Madhu, I'll say Karibu, APHRC, Karibu, Nairobi, Karibu, Kenya. It's his first time in Kenya, and it's his first time in Africa, outside of Southern Africa, which never counts. So welcome, Madhu, to the real Africa. <laughs> and um, Madhu is one of those people that we met on Twitter. You know those hashtags? Not that kind of meeting, but we met on Twitter. And I think it became uh, kindred spirits, and we care about the same things when it comes to global health and equity. And it's so good to finally meet. And uh, I think today will be amazing. And I hope that you found it worthwhile. Other than Madhu, I want to welcome Marie Claire. Marie Claire is another one of those we met on Twitter, but not in the same way as Madhu. And uh, she's based in Nairobi. So welcome to APHRC. I want to welcome you to Nairobi or Kenya, but welcome to APHRC. And I think after today and beyond, we shall keep on engaging because as you've heard from Patterson, yes, uh, we need as many members of the community as possible and you're the future. For us, we are like, you know, moving towards retirement. So you guys, you, you know, we'll take over the fight. But welcome, Marie Claire. Samuel, <laughs> Oti, we go back a long way, Samuel. Uh, we didn't meet on Twitter. We met here at APH Chelsea. So he's the one that got away. <laughs> But Sam uh, was a member of the APHRC community, and then he went on to bigger things and greater things. So for you, I'll say Karibu Tena. And then Dr. Githingi, I, I don't know whether he's already online, uh, but I, Dr. Githingi is also our partner in crime, a very, um, I would say fearless African voice. I'm online. Who is based in Nairobi as well. So I went to, uh, he's been here before, so I went to welcome you to APHRC, but I will welcome you to the event. And then uh, just to say that we moved some small mountains for this event to happen. And the thing is one of the small mountains that we are moving because he's in London. And he said, I'll make time two hours, you know, for this session. But then there are also other people who have moved mountains. So I welcome everybody who has made it to the APHRC campus. We had about 60 people had signed up and I think the others are coming, but thanks for moving your small mountains, the Nairobi traffic and putting aside your agenda and schedules and making time for this event. And lastly, I'll welcome our online audience. We had about 611 people who had signed up as of this morning. Uh, the number may have gone up, but we welcome you in your own way. You've moved small mountains and loaded airtime or credit, but also put things aside on your agenda to participate in this event. Now, I think today I would describe it as both opportunistic, but opportune, because opportunistic in the sense that we organized it around Madhu's visit to Nairobi. 
Madhu said I'll be in town and I have one day and that's Monday. And we said, there's no way we cannot have Madhu and others, you know, meet and talk about some of these issues which are important. But it's also opportune in light of recent high profile uh, incidents, especially regarding the issues of visas and denials and, you know, mistreatment and all that. But what these incidents have done really is to bring to the fore long standing issues. Because I can assure you behind every visa incident that we see, there are tens of thousands of other incidents that we never get to hear. And behind every incident, there's unquantifiable harm in terms of questioning, second guessing our intent, the indignity and humiliation of the whole visa application process. And so it's something that is the high profile incidents bring it to the fore, but it's something that has been going on for quite some time. So today is a day as good as any other to talk about this. But I think more fundamentally, these incidents also, uh, you know, they, they are symptoms of a larger system that is inherently unequal and unfair, that also ascribes, I think, less value to African lives. And so the, the framing was not just visa apartheid, but also vaccine apartheid. So this is all the same system. And what we see are manifestations of the same systems. And so today we are building a community. And it's a question of expectations. I was asking myself, what expectations do I have for today? Um, and I said, I think they range from one side, one end of the spectrum that we can rant and ranting is good. We can rant and go home and that's fine. Oh, Maybe we learn something from each other, from our experiences. And then on the other extreme is that actually the system is dismantled, which may not happen, it's not going to happen today, or something in between that we discuss, we talk, we learn something, and maybe we take some intermediate steps that are taking us somewhere and not just anywhere, but somewhere better. So today I call upon you, as I said, we are building a community. Let's run, let's talk, let's share experiences. Let's try to act in our own little ways and big ways to set up a system that is better. And I think if I was to make one last appeal is that some conversations are uncomfortable, but they're necessary. And what I would appeal for the Africans and the non-Africans in the room is that we really need a community. And it is our country, it's our continent, it is us, it's our lives that are at stake here. And it's time we took our destiny in our own hands and fought because if you don't find the system, if you don't find the system, no one is going to do it for us. So I will come into this event and wish you very interesting, uh, interactive uh, deliberations. And as I've said, let's learn from each other and let's do something. Thank you very much. And on this note, I'll welcome Madhu to give us uh, his keynote speech. And then after that, hand over the program back to Patterson. Madhu. Um, uh, Jambo, uh, greetings. Uh, I'm, I think I also learned uh, Shikomo. Uh, I hope that was okay. Um, it's a great pleasure to be in Kenya for the first time. Uh, this is the first uh, non-South African nation I'm visiting on this great continent. And everybody tells me that South Africa is not Africa. So uh, this is the real Africa, I'm told. So I'm just delighted to be here. Um, thank you, Kathleen. Uh, you're my African sister. I'm delighted that I could finally meet you in person, even though we've been working so closely with uh, each other on the editorial uh, as editors of PLOS Global Public Health. And thanks all of you, Samuel and everyone, for uh, making it here to uh, talk about this critical issue. I've uh, kind of titled this short talk as more to set the scene. Um,
Um, I've titled this uh, short uh, talk to set the stage from uh, vaccine to visa apartheid. Is there any hope at all for global health? But before I do, um, I do want to spend a little bit of time uh, reflecting upon myself. Uh, first of all, um, I'm not Black. So I cannot never truly know what it means to be a Black person in this world today and what it means to suffer the kind of racism and discrimination that Black people do. Um, I can understand as an Indian, as a person of color, but I can never truly know. So to that extent, I probably shouldn't be giving this talk, but there is some value in, I think, hearing it from others, uh, which may be in some ways uh, validating for all of you who've been going through this. Secondly, nothing I say is going to be new to Black colleagues here. I'm going to tell you what you probably already know, but it probably will be uh, of relevance to the non-Black people who are listening uh, and in the audience because there is a lot of learning that we have to do, those of us who are not Black. I am currently, although I was born and raised in India, I'm currently living in a high-income country, Canada, which did not distinguish itself well during this pandemic. Um, Canada is a nation that is known for vaccine holding, and we did not contribute and donate as much as we could have and should have. And so I understand that I come from a place of great privilege today. Uh, for example, it took me 24 hours to get a visa to come to Kenya. I can imagine what you would need to do to get a visa to Canada right now. You probably couldn't even get a visa appointment for the next year. And even if you did apply and jump through 50 hoops, you probably will get denied. Um, and so uh, this is the unevenness in global health that we all feel and know to be true. I have had access to Omicron bivalent boosters in Canada, and not even a quarter of the African population has received even two doses, let alone a booster, let alone an Omicron-based booster. So I hope um, um, I'm, I'm here uh, as a humble ally, and I hope the panelists will keep me accountable and honest. And if I make a mistake, please correct me. So, we don't have to know much to understand that global health has this colonial roots and colonization, colonialism derives from white supremacy, right? That is so, that much is very well known. Um, This is another reality check on how hard it is must be for you when you are invited to join events on Zoom uh, and, and everybody expects you to just show up with no problems on IT or infrastructure. So I see white supremacy and anti-blackness as two sides of the same coin, and, and they are. So wherever there's white supremacy, there is anti-blackness. And the impact of colonialism, and Samuel and I were talking about this earlier today, is that whenever I discuss that this global health has colonial roots, the quick response I get from people in the global north is, yes, that's all in the past. Everything is fine now, right? And I'm sure you hear it all the time. And I think it is absolutely evident and clear as daylight that it is not in the past. It is happening even as we speak, because after all, vaccine apartheid is now, visa apartheid is now. Everything that we are seeing and, and, and experiencing is what's contemporary. And so I want us to dispel this myth that we live in a world where everything, all traces of colonialism have disappeared. They have not. And while the historic books are very clear 
Franz Fanon, um, Ngugi, and others. I'd like for you to read a more contemporary book if you haven't already, and that is The New Age of the Empire by Kehinde Andrews, a brutally honest account of how imperialism and colonialism impact countries even today as we speak. So there have been so many calls for decolonizing global health, right? Mostly in the last three, four, five years, and many of us have participated in such calls or we've written about it in events. This is also true in the development industry. There's a lot of activity and, and discussion in the humanitarian aid world on what decolonizing development could and should look like. And we see report after report after report emerge from Wellcome Trust, London School, Liverpool School, Medicine Sans Frontier. They are all writing reports and admitting that they are structurally problematic. So at least they have evolved to a stage of acknowledgement that yes, we have deeply structural racism buried in our organizations that we have to do better. Whether they are able to do anything about it or not is a different story, but at least after Black Lives Matter, everybody is able to stand up and say, we have a problem. And the fact that a Nobel Prize winning organization like MSF is admitting that it has structural racism buried in it speaks volumes to the world that we live in and what that means for all of us working in this area. And the lack of diversity, whether it's the United Nations, whether it's uh, organizations in, in global health, is just so clear and obvious that the more analysis we do, the more we find. So I ask myself, as many of us did, what unifies all these concerns? And our iteration of what we think unifies all of this is this elephant. Each of us is seeing different parts of the elephant. And I think underneath it all is that global health and development is firmly in the grasp of those who are extraordinarily powerful and privileged. And they like to keep it that way. And that manifests itself in lack of equity, diversity, or inclusion in white supremacy, white saviorism, patriarchy, colonialism, capitalism are all manifestations of this underlying problem. And so I want to kind of pose two questions, and, and both of them bother the heck out of me as someone who wants to work in global health. The first question is, can global health achieve health equity? We all claim to be working in health equity. Right? Everybody in global health will say the same thing. But can we truly achieve health equity when we leave, live in a deeply unequal world and the world has been made even more unequal because of the pandemic? That's the first question to ask. Is health equity uh, an illusion that is unattainable because the world itself is so inequitable? Right. Secondly, if global health as a field, as a discipline, as an area of research or practice, itself is structurally so unequal, then how on earth can it deliver its objective of achieving health equity, right? How can an uneven discipline rife with power asymmetries ever successfully address what it is purporting to work towards health equity, right? So here is my, uh, uh, um, some data to back my first concern. What does global health even mean? What does health inequity even mean in such an unequal world we live in? Here we are, a handful of people, basically a few white men, own as much wealth as 50% of the world's population. Just a few people that could sit in the front row of this um, um, auditorium pretty much own more wealth than half of the world's population. This level of wealth concentration has not ever been seen in the history of humankind. And it's growing worse by the second. During this pandemic, the richest people have added billions to their wealth, even as more and more people have been pushed into extreme poverty. This is a staggering infographic, staggering because it just blows your mind when you actually look at it. And the caption from Max Rosa says, where you live isn't just more important than all your other characteristics. It's more important than everything else put together. And if you can't read it, uh, it's too uh, faint for you to see. I'll just explain it here. Life expectancy of birth 
is uh, 52 years in, um, I think it's, uh, I can't see the, the thing, it's hidden here. It's, a, it's an African nation. I think it's Sierra Leone, 52 years, and it's 84 years in Japan. That's the amount of gap in life expectancy between an African nation and a wealthy country like Japan. Same thing, median years of schooling in Germany is nine, 10 times more than another African nation. Africa appears at the bottom pretty much on every one of these indicators. That's how much the inequities are. And when I teach global health at my university in Canada, I tell my students that if they are Canadians, they've already won the life's lottery. That's how privileged they are and they did nothing to earn it, right? They were just born there and that's it. That sets the trend for the rest of the life. And I tell them, if you are a Canadian and if you are at McGill University, your privilege levels have already touched stratospheric heights. And that's the perspective with which you approach global health, right? Because you come from a position of great power and privilege. And this vaccine apartheid, the, the, the less we talk about it, the better, but how can we not talk about it, right? Because it's caused so much anxiety. I just read a staggering statistics. Africa is the only region in the world right now where the sheer number of unvaccinated people exceed the number of vaccinated people. Not even 25% of people on this continent have had access to two doses of vaccine, let alone boosters, let alone antivirals, let alone anything else that we have in our armamentarium. So this pretty much this region has been forgotten by the world, right? And then we get all this BS, oh, Africans are hesitant. Africans have no cold chain. They can't deliver vaccines, even if we give them. This is the kind of rubbish that the international media presents to all of us. And this is what many people genuinely believe, right? So this is where we are with the, the, the uh, COVID vaccine apartheid. Turns out it's the same vaccine apartheid for monkeypox. 80% of monkeypox vaccines are just in United States. And the African region has had zero. How is that even making any sense? This is the place which has dealt with monkeypox for years and has had zero access even today when I could have walked into a clinic in Montreal and gotten a shot for myself. It makes absolutely no sense, but this is like a repetitive theme in all of global health. And climate crisis, I assure you, is going to be no different. Where are all the carbon excess emissions happening? In the global north. Who's going to pay for climate crisis? The African region. We see what's happening in Pakistan right now, the devastation. And, and Africa is extraordinarily vulnerable to climate crisis, but has hardly contributed any carbon emissions in its entire history of humankind. So who is going to get punished? People here. Who is polluting and who is consuming? It's the global north. So this is the kind of inequities that we see. And it's not just a health issue. It's economic inequity. It's climate crisis inequity. It's vaccine inequity. All of them. Coming to the field of global health itself, if we all accept that global health came from colonial medicine, tropical medicine, whatever it was called, it still continues to be centered on what folks in the global health think can and should be done and what they're willing to do out of their generosity, right? They want to be firmly in power and then whatever they choose to give as charity, as gifts, as philanthropy, is how global health is being seen. And even today, it's neither diverse, nor truly global. And I will show you data now to convince you that is the case. And these are not my impressions. Everything I'm gonna say is backed by data. So let's look at the Global Health 5050 report many of you may have seen. Year after year, the report shows us where are the biggest global health organizations headquartered, where are the biggest decisions in global health made? Decisions that are life and death for people here are often made far away from here. And there's no surprise there that Europe and North America is the heart of where global health action happens. That's where money is held. That's where the biggest decisions are made. What about the people who serve on these, uh, or are lead, leaders of these global health organizations, right? Mostly men. 17 out of 20 are nationals of high income countries. Only three out of 20 are nationals of low and middle income country. And even there, 
virtually nobody who is a woman from a low income country. So if you ask me who runs global health, it's predominantly white, older men in high income countries. That's who runs global health. If you ask me who is least represented in global health, I would say it's black women in low income countries. That is where global health is as of today. So this is not a historic past, it's current data. And they've gone and looked at last year, this year, they've looked at the actual board composition. Again, you can see if you look at the board seats of all of these global health organizations, two and a half percent are nationals of low income countries. Just two and a half percent of all board seats are held by people in low income nations. Where do global health grants go? Whether it's Fogarty, whether it's Wellcome Trust, whether it's USAID, it's Gates Foundation, 70 to 80% of global health grants go to organizations, institutions, universities, and contractors in the highest income countries. And then they eventually will trickle here. But the monies are held and that, and whoever holds the money, you and I know, will control the agenda and will dictate what happens to that money. It's as simple as that. And I know Catherine and others had written a whole article on why malaria funding is going to organizations in high income countries. Who better than this cont continent to study malaria and, and, and are leaders in malaria and yet the money will have to go somewhere else and eventually find its way to people who are actually doing malaria. Same thing, who's publishing? Stuck in the middle. Even when the paper is about Africa, African authors are usually stuck in the middle. They're not the first authors. They're not the senior authors. And this is a recurring pattern across all aspects of global health publishing. This is true. Who is an editor? Well, that's a study we did. Again, you can see that editors, there are very few editors who are people of color, people who are black, and people who are based in low-income countries. In fact, I would think that Catherine would be one of the only few black women in Africa who's actually an editor-in-chief of a major international journal. And even that only happened a year ago. So just tells you how far behind global health is compared to the population that global health claims to be serving or claims to be centered upon. So the visa apartheid now, to me, is yet another flavor of this anti-Blackness. I remember I was in Montreal. I live in Montreal. The AIDS conference happened in Montreal. We were all on the stage and there are pictures of pictures of people, of panels that were empty. Nobody showed up. Africa, the most impacted continent for HIV AIDS. Africans had the hardest time getting a visa to come for an AIDS conference. Why was the AIDS conference even held in a country like Canada is beyond my understanding. Right. And this is happening right now as we speak. A tropical diseases conference is happening in Seattle. Go figure that one out for yourself. What does that even mean to have a tropical diseases conference far away from the tropics? And this is a recurring, again, theme in global health. We just do things the way we've done it for the last century without even asking the question, is this got anything to do with the people who really know the most about the topic? and who are literally dying of the topic under discussion, whether it's malaria or tropical diseases or uh, uh, HIV AIDS. And we saw you know, visa denial after visa denial, not just for AIDS conference, the World Health Summit, the World uh, Health Assembly, the um, Bogota conference. I mean, how wacky is that? That another global South nation, Colombia, has so much anti-Blackness in them. It's one thing for Canada to deny Africans, but to have another global South country demonstrate that kind of anti-Blackness, this to me is anti-Blackness. And anti-Blackness is not just about white people. Brown people can be anti-Black. People of other people of color can have deep anti-Blackness in them. And I know for uh, this for a fact, Indians can be anti-Black. So we've got to have that humility to understand that this is a very widespread problem, which is not just to do with just white people or white, predominantly white nations alone. So when I look at all of this data and everything that we've seen in the last 
even three years, I was just discussing this with someone, you know, it's not that these are new, but I think this pandemic and the Black Lives Matter movement has just exposed us the real world its stunning clarity. None of this is new, but it's just in our face right now. It's inescapable. You cannot walk through global health and development and not see this. And if you're not seeing it, there's something pathological about this. Really, because how on earth would you not see repetitive patterns of the same behavior again and again and again? How many times have you seen from HIV AIDS to Ebola to COVID to monkeypox, Africa is always last on the list. For any product, I don't care what it is, antiretrovirals, COVID vaccine, monkeypox vaccine, Paxlovid, it does not matter. You will always find Africa at the bottom of the list. It's as if a continent doesn't even exist in the minds of people. How? How do you explain this in 2022? It boggles my mind. It just does. I can't bring myself to understand. As I'm not a black person, as I said, but even I can tell that this is anti-blackness. There's no other explanation for this that I can find. Nobody can convince me that this is not real. Nobody can convince me that this is not structural. And nobody can tell me this is just a temporary bug. No, this is not a bug. This is the system working the way it has been designed to work forever. Right? The colonial systems are well and truly alive even today as we speak. Now question is, is there any hope for us who work in global health? And here, I think we have to have two sets of people weigh in. The, the panelists today are all Africans. And they will tell us what we need to hear from the perspective of someone who's at the receiving end of this oppression. And me sitting in a high income country is on the other side of this coin. And I will tell you what I think we, those of us who are in high income countries ought to be doing. And together, let's see if this makes any sense. I use this graphic a lot these days when I speak. And I think this is, to me, a frame sh shift in my own thinking. It has taken me many years to get here. But the way I see it is the first column is how global health, global north, high income countries, however you want to call it. This is the way global health not sees global health. We see it as a charity case. We see it as an act of philanthropy, kindness, aid, donations, development assistance politically correct term to use here, right? Development assistance, saviorism. We will save Africa. We will save low-income nations. And we love dependency, that you will wait for our gifts whenever it comes. Might come only in 2025, your vaccines, but it's coming, right? Wait for your turn, right? That is the way global health has always worked. And I think that first column absolutely needs to make way for the second column. And from everything that I've seen, living 30 years of my life in the global South in India, I think global South truly wants to see it as a matter of human rights and justice, right? It's a matter of justice and rights. You have as much right to a COVID vaccine or a monkeypox vaccine as any European or American or Canadian, period. End of discussion, right? Then it's only a matter of how do we get there, right? as a matter of reparations for all the colonial damages and extractions. And no continent has suffered more than this continent in terms of all the extractivism that has happened and continues to happen. Extraction is happening even as we speak. It is not a historic relic as we speak. Autonomy, respect, make decisions that show your agency and what you want to be achieving. Self-determination and self-sustenance, wow. Loaded words are so critical for us in Global North to understand. Getting behind that second column is where I think global health future truly lies. And I wrote this uh, blog post in Forbes on how the trickle-down model of global health is simply not working. And I wrote that in February of 2020, even before we knew this pandemic was going to be a pandemic. And I had written that and everything I said has turned out to be true. Waiting for this trickle-down charity model has been a disaster. And every time it's a disaster, whether you waited for antiretrovirals to come, which took the best part of a decade, 
by which time millions of Africans got infected by the virus and waiting for the COVID vaccines to come, who the hell knows when it's gonna come. And this is never gonna work out. One has to flip this to one of self-determination justice. And that's what African leaders have been saying repeatedly. Give us the damn vaccine recipe, we'll make it. We don't need charity anymore. We wanna be self-sustenant. We wanna be self-reliant. We don't wanna wait for things that are never gonna come, right? Backing this vision that African leaders have articulated so many times in so many fora ought to be the future of global health. Your own conferences, your own CDC, your own global health universities, your own mRNA vaccine hub, this is the future of global health. Now, if people in the global north cannot buy into this and back this, then I have a a fear that they don't truly understand what it means to decolonize. They still want to maintain that charity model that they've hung on to for a century because that's what keeps them happy. They think that they are the saviors and that they will get things done and they know more than all of us here, right? At a minimum, I would argue, if you can't back this vision, at least don't block this vision. But this blocking is what has happened with the TRIPS IP waiver. So many countries wanted the TRIPS IP waiver so that Africa can make its own vaccines. Rich nations, including Canada, effectively blocked and buried it. So we'll neither give nor will we empower or share. That's where global health currently is. And now, so that's the vision of the global south. And we will hear more about that from Gitinji, Catherine, Samuel, and others. Now, I now directly speak to people like me, people who are coming from the privileged global north and have power and resources and everything at our disposal. What is our future? Do we have a role in this new global health that we are conceiving? The only role that I can see for myself is one of allyship. I need to get behind people and back them, not as a leader, but as an enabler, as an ally as an accomplice, as a supporter, not as someone who's gonna come and fix a problem here. I know I can't fix a problem. This is not my problem to fix, but I can certainly be an ally. And so I've written a piece and I hope you will read it. People like me will read it because this is a long, hard process of allyship. And to understand allyship and to enact allyship and to walk the path of allyship, I think the first step is to go through structured training on power, privilege, anti-oppression, and anti-racism. I myself have gone through something like eight hours of training. And every time I go to those trainings, my eyes open to my own privilege. When I look at my privilege and I map myself on that wheel, I realize that except for not being white, I pretty much check off every box of power and privilege. Right? So I know deep in my heart that I have a lot of work to do. And along the same lines, if you understand intersectionality, then it becomes obvious. White people in global health must be allies to black, indigenous, and people of color. Global North folks must be allies to global South folks. Men dominate global health, men like me. We have to learn to be allies to women in global health, right? Women are least represented in global health, white women, must be allies to black women and people of color. And the list goes on and on and on because that's what intersectionality truly means. There is no end to this because that's what intersectionality really is. So allyship for people like me is active, consistent, arduous practice of unlearning, reevaluating, in which a person in a position of privilege and power seeks to operate in solidarity with the marginalized group. Allyship is not a noun. We have to constantly work at it. It's a verb, right? It's not self-defined. I shouldn't go my, around calling myself an ally. I shouldn't be acting out of guilt. And it's certainly not about saving others. And I certainly shouldn't be expecting a reward. Oh, here is an award for you. You are an ally. That's not the way this business works. An ally is all about humility, being in the background and doing the right thing with expecting nothing in return. And so people will tell you, and they've told me as well, you could be an ally and do nothing. 
An ally is not an ally unless they are truly willing to cede space, money, resources, power, pass on the mic. If you're unwilling to do any of this, you are no ally. So real allyship is shown in practice, not in words. And this is where I worry most about people who claim they're allies. Well, you had an opportunity to do the right thing, share the vaccines, share the recipe, and you didn't. What kind of an ally are you? Right? So I see global health organizations claiming to be working in solidarity. How many times have you heard during this pandemic, we are all in this together? That's the biggest BS I've ever heard. There's no such thing. No rich nation has ever acted in anything beyond their own self-interest. And the next crisis comes, that's exactly what they will do again. So this being in it together, global solidarity, global citizenship are all words that we throw. But when push comes to shove, are you truly ready to give up power, sp space, and, and resources, and time? You're not, then you're not an ally anymore. So for us, the path to allyship is hard, but it needs to be very real. So authentic allyship is way harder than just claiming to be allies. So we can end, I can end by saying there are so many examples I can think of in terms of allyship. For example, I was pushing Canada very hard on why are we not donating? That could be seen as an allyship, right? Why are we not doing more? But if Canada had been pushed to back the TRIPS IP waiver, and if African nations had started manufacturing their own vaccines and they were using it right now, that would be a true act of liberation, co-liberation, right? Genuine act of solidarity, right? To go beyond allyship, to be actually a co-liberator or a co-conspirator. Right now, even as we start holding conferences in Global North and running around the world jet setting, what does it mean to be an ally to people in LMICs? So that piece that I wrote on passport and, and visa privilege to which some of you contributed, I mean, it went viral because it captured the deep rooted anxiety that all of you have, that I've had. My first visa application to the United States was rejected in 30 seconds without even opening the application. One look at my face, the US consulate decided that I was a high-risk person not to be trusted ever. And I know how I went home literally crying. It took me days, months to recover from that humiliating experience. So I know, I know what it means in my heart to go through this, but to go through this again and again and again. I mean, I, I cannot tell you, even while standing in the, in the corridor for this conversation, how many of you opened your hearts to your horrible racist experiences that you're enduring, getting pulled out of lines. This is like daily life for you. And so this is not a joke, whether it's the AIDS conference, whether it's the um, you know meetings that we um, organize, I can't tell you how bad things are in terms of how much worse it has gotten during this pandemic. I mean, there are some African countries for which for a US visa, you have to wait till 2024 to even apply. Forget getting it. That is not at all on the discussion. You can get your application through that window, 2024 or beyond. Male allyship. We can have a whole conversation on what that means. Why are men not ceding positions of power and privilege, even when they know that women are so least represented in global health, right? Journals. Catherine and I, along with Julia Robinson, we are leading a new journal Every inch of the way, we're trying to be inten intentional about this. We do not want to repeat the mistakes that other journals are making. And that has taken heck of a lot of time and effort from us. But to even have Catherine as an editor-in-chief is an act of progress, right? We want to bring that into every aspect of the journal. We can talk about global health training and how to reform it. Why should someone go to London for a degree in malaria? They should be coming here to get that degree in malaria, right? Or neglected tropical diseases or whatever. It's time to truly flip the way we think about global health. Global health funders, discussion with uh, Samuel earlier today. Global health funders, if they care about global health, should be directly funding African agencies with nobody in between. No middle people, no brokers, no mediators, 
directly give money to APHRC or Kemri or whatever, get the job done. That is what global health funders should be thinking about. That's what decolonizing global health truly means from a funder's perspective. And organizational change. Why are all these agencies headquartered in, in, in Europe or America or wherever? Why are they not headquartered here? Why is there no decentralizing happening in power structures and global health? So people are talking about case studies in that region. So lastly, for me, allyship should never be about, I will give up something to, just to feel good, right? Allyship truly is about genuine liberation. And this is a lovely quote by an indigenous elder who said, if you have come to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. The point is inequities are harmful for all of us, even those who are in the global north. We will also suffer. Racism is bad for all of us, even white people and brown people. We got to dismantle those structures of racism that exist today. So collective liberation is one way of thinking about allyship. And I think we are, a, we are a long way away from that in global health right now. So conversations like this, I hope, where we'll get to then now hear about uh, from our African colleagues on what they think needs to get done. Hopefully we can advance this uh, field further. Thank you so much. Asante San. I think that is very explosive. Uh, things that we took for granted, we never really knew they're actually important. And I like the way you've actually brought it to us. And of course, to those of us in the audience, as well as those of us online. I think uh, one of the words I've loved using is development assistance. Now I'll actually use it cautiously because it means something different other than what I used to always believe uh, it meant. And I think I also like that we need to start looking at allyship, how we building allies across all the barriers and, and, and how do we then uh, play a stake uh, into some of these challenges that we have seen. And it's always amazing that uh, sometimes uh, if you're coming from the global south, you tend to think it's okay, it's normal. I was telling people how uh, a while back I used to teach at uh, the UN University in Turin and every time I will go there for the communications training in Amsterdam, I'll be pulled off the queue. And I thought it was normal. <laughs> it happened to me three times until I, I realized I was actually being profiled. So, and, and it was so amazing because uh, I was traveling on a UNLP, which is a UN uh, passport. And even that nobody recognized it. They asked me, uh, bring your national passport because that's the one you want to look at. So these things are happening. And indeed, uh, you may think that they're normal and they're okay, but they should not uh, be seen to be okay. We have to do everything possible uh, to change that. I will now ask the team to actually just give us a, um, a quick uh, interaction on Menti uh, to also just bring the team uh, that is uh, virtual uh, to give us their, uh, their views. And after that, then we will get into the panel discussion and we will start with uh, Dr. Gitahi of AMREF. Thank you so much. Florence, uh, please, you can come and uh, take over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patricia. And thank you all for being here. We wanted to ensure we have a dialogue both for the people in the room and those online. So we kindly request you to go on your phone or your computer and log on to www.menti.com. Um, the, the passport for the Menti is 3818 I'm happy to see that um, some of our participants online are already starting to speak about it. Our first question is, why is it important for professionals from the South to participate in global health conference. Good so fast. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the Menti code is 3818-1033. So if you, are, if you are on Zoom, you will see it on your in the chat. Um, if you're in the room, let me repeat again. 
1033. I hope we are all now in. Three eight one eight one zero three three. Three eight. So then uh, go to www.menti.com and the code is three eight one eight one zero three three. Three eight one eight one zero three three. So our first question. Is why is it important for professionals from the South to participate in global health conferences? So you can use one word, you can write a number, you can write a sentence. So you can use a word, you can write a sentence. Um, let me just read some of the responses we have. It's important because of sharing expertise and representation. Um, it's an opportunity for cross-country learning. Our voice matters. And I think that's very clear, and that's why this, um, this, this, this discussion is very important. Because we have the, we hold the knowledge we share to share our research, um, to better health outcomes for vulnerable populations and communities worldwide, to understand the context better. Because the South bears the heaviest burden of global health challenges. Um, we have about 98 responses. I'm trying to scroll down and read others. Networking, representation comes up again. Representation, democracy of information, unique authors or owners of a perspective, the danger of a single story, as uh, Chimamanda Adichie spoke about that, nothing for us without us. They know the challenges of implementation of solutions being discussed. Here the they is the professionals from the South, the global South. Um, respect, our voice matters. Um, and someone has actually mentioned that we need, need, need to create the disability rights movement for the phrase, the phrasing on um, nothing about us without us. Self-determination, health is global. We saw this with COVID. Um, we are now at about 116 responses. Um, we need to weigh in on conversations affecting the populations. So I think now we can go to the next question. We will share. Uh, we will. We will keep sharing um, this. This. This feedback that's coming from our mentee. So the next question is: Have you faced visa discrimination? <laughs> Let's see from a show of hands in the room. Have you faced visa discrimination? <laughs> <laughs> I can see some people are even lifting both hands. Plus <laughs> <laughs> <Club> legs. <laughs> oh, how many times would have been a better question? Okay, we shall perhaps we shall we shall we shall have that when you we when we have this discussion later. Uh, Prof. Mathis is reminding us maybe the question is how many times because this happens so often. Although I see some people have said that um, we have 41, 49 people who said yes, and um, they faced it. Forty two people say no. Uh, we only have 94 people who've responded. So let's see. It's just a quick answer. Um, we will move to the next question once we go beyond 130. So at this point, we have 57 people who have faced visa discrimination, 53 haven't. It will be interesting to know from the ones who haven't faced visa discrimination. From a show of hands in the room, Maybe we can, okay, thank you. <laughs> You've answered the experiment I was trying to. <laughs> it's a question of uh, visa, uh, visa privilege also. Uh, is, if I, is that correct? Am I saying the correct answer? Yeah, thank you. So 61 people have faced visa discrimination, 56 haven't. Um, so yeah, it, it, might, it might be an, an issue of what passport you hold, um, what nationality, are you from the global south? Do you have the privilege of what, like uh, Prof. Madhu mentioned? Yes, he's, um, he's from India, but works in the global north, and so also has a bit of privilege when it comes to um, um, access. We are at 123 responses, 63. Yes, um, 60 no. So we'll move to the next question as we continue getting responses on this. I think we are now at, yeah, 60. 125 people, 64 yes, 61 no. 
I think it would have been nice to have a qualitative answer here. Tell us a bit more on that. Um, but you can also tweet. Please remember you can tweet your responses on, on Twitter. Tell us um, why or an experience, describe that experience of visa discrimination or the, why you think you haven't faced any visa discrimination. Please do tell us on, on Twitter and we're using the hashtags global health inequalities and visa apartheid. Uh, those are our hashtags. So in one or two words, our next question, describe global health inequalities that Africans professional, African professionals face. So this is not just the global South, as we noted, Colombia did have, uh, is in the global <laughs> South. And we're just using one word, in a word or two. So if you have two words, first put one word, then put the next one, um, and we see what words are coming out. I can see disrespect, um, racism, dismissal, um, discrimination, judgment, indignity, racism. Racism is, um, in this word cloud, racism is really um, coming out strongly. Indignity, um, resources, exclusion. Uh, we have funding, black explaining. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> this we must say has been borrowed from um, the, yeah, the, the concept of mansplaining, marginalization, dismissal. Um, the cloud keeps moving so quickly. Degree apartheid. So sometimes it's about our qualifications. Ignored, undervalued, rubber stamping, discrimination, shortage of funding, um, grants that are awarded, um, some of the, the inequities we see. We have 77 people who've responded so far. Inequality, um, so discrimination, racism, exclusion, funding, tokenism, judgment, stigma, profiling, condensation, slow professional development, low cadre positions, um, fault finding, underrepresentation, glass ceilings. Um, we talked about uh, the, how many women we have on boards and um, the kind of privilege that uh, Dr. Katin Chobutunji has as one of the few women who are uh, editors in chief of, a, of an academic journal. We are now at 89. Um, maybe we can get to 100 participants and we'll not close this. You can still continue giving us your views. And again, please tweet, please, um, please tweet. Our hashtags are global in uh, global global uh, health inequity. Global inequities. <laughs> global health inequities. Hashtag global health inequities and uh, visa apartheid. So disrespect stands out. Profiling, indignity, funding, resources, doubt, <laughs> harassment. Um, doubt is still there. Dismissal. Uh, profiling. Um, trying to see what else we have not talked about, discrimination, interference, poor publication records, gender inequalities, inadequate resources, anti-blackness. Um, yeah, so really microaggressions, um, lack of recognition, educational discrimination, leading research, fault finding, data mining, demeaning, um, not condescended on and not imposing our agenda, not being heard. So these are some of the views that are coming from the, from, the, from the people who are part of this conversation, both in the room and outside the room. And I think it sets the stage for this, uh, the panel discussion we are going to have. And so I'm going to hand over back to our moderator, Patterson Siema, our Policy Engagement and Communication Director at APHRC to take us to the next step. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, indeed, it gets interesting um, every other second. So allow me to take this opportunity to invite uh, the panelists to the high table. Thank you. Just. Uh, I hope uh, that Tari one, you, you are able to hear us and that you can be able to join us. Yes, I can hear you. I just can't put my video on because it says uh, you cannot start your video because the host has disabled it. So if I could be enabled, I would start my video as well. Okay, so I think the team uh, kindly 
uh, enable Daktari One or upgrade him uh, to Zoom business class so that he can actually be able to uh, join us on this. Uh, I'll actually just uh, quickly ask the, I mean, this team has quite uh, very uh, strong uh, resumes and CVs. They've done a lot to the champions for the global health. Uh, but maybe I could just start uh, with Dr. Maria Claire Ongari. Uh, maybe just a quick introduction of how you would like us to get to know you here, because what I have here is a lot. <laughs> Um, thank you so much. Um, friends and col colleagues actually call me MC. Um, it's, it's Daktari was reserved for when I was practicing in the wards, and I still use that till today. I will start off by saying I am a general practitioner by training, uh, not very young in the field, finished medical school in 2019, um, but have been in student leadership since university. And currently I lead the Young Doctors Network at the Kenya Medical Association alongside other um, affiliations. And I think it's been an interesting journey for me because I've seen the positive allyship that Prof Pai has talked about. And I've also seen the negative allyship. And I've also seen visa discrimination. And I think in a nutshell, one thing I'll say is you wouldn't really know these things are happening until you flip the reflection of the mirror and not look at your reflection, but the reflection of how someone else is seeing it. And that's been the biggest gap. And I'm here to share more on how young people have been affected by the same. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that. Um, indeed, and also being a young person, I think, and a, and a, and a lady, that complicates matters. Um, and, and I've just heard from uh, Matthew how difficult it is for women. So I, I can imagine when you're a young person, people think you're trying to flee your continent, uh, which is um, in many cases not the truth because the people really building this continent are young people. Uh, we now can actually maybe uh, have an introduction from uh, Dr. Sam. Uh, thank you, Patterson. My name is Sam Uti. Used to be a, a APHRC person. <laughs> uh, my background is in medicine and public health. I'm currently working as a program officer with uh, Canada's International Development Research Center in the Global Health Program. Uh, and I have many side hustles. Um, for example, I'm a co-founder of the Global Health Decolonization Movement in Africa. Uh, and then I have a podcast called MedTech Africa that is trying to promote digital health uh, innovation in Africa. So it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, thank you so much. So I, I think... Uh... Dr. Gidinji, I'm told now we can uh, get to see you and hear you. Yes, that's true. I can see myself as well, and thanks for upgrading me to business class. Okay, excellent. Uh, so for the panel that uh, is global and may need to know who you are, uh, kindly just uh, let us know how you'd want us to know you today. Uh, thank you very much. I am at Dr. Taiwan on Twitter. My name is Gidinji Gitahi. I'm the global CEO for Amref Health Africa, but also um, a true African in whom Africa is born, not just born in Africa. Thank you so much. And, and, and indeed, uh, quite fearless, as uh, Catherine says. Uh, so I, I actually would want to maybe just start with, with you, Dr. Gitahi. Uh, so last week, uh, you actually tweeted that Amber Worldwide uh, withdrew some of the global health from the global health system in person participation that was in Colombia. And, and we know why, due to systemic visa and passport discrimination from uh, Global South participants. What made your organization take up this position? Uh, thank you very much. And thanks for having me. I would like to pass special thanks to Catherine for agreeing to host this meeting, to Mantu who actually reached out to me after my Twitter rant and uh, also to others who've uh, come before this conversation, like uh, Dr. Wala, who has actually highlighted visa discrimination in the past. And more recently, I also uh, got a reach out from Professor Sanait Fiseha saying, how do we uh, amplify this advocacy? So I want to assure all of you that there's great support for this, um, for this agenda. 
The next thing I want to say is that uh, I also did get reach out from colleagues or friends of mine from the global health. And uh, some of them were wondering why I took this position. And uh, I, was, I was not surprised. And, uh, and, and I think this is the point we are making that those who live with a privilege don't understand the suffering of those who don't have the privilege. And I'll talk about that as I go. So other than getting support from people who understood what was going on, I also got questions on why and why this was important from people who, uh, who we can blame uh, simply because they were coming from their privilege point of view because they're also my close friends and I believe they have very good intentions. So let me just make a few remarks to answer your question. The first thing to say is that um, uh, Amref Health Africa works in, um, with global stakeholders to ensure that we achieve community-led and people-centered lasting health change in Africa. For many of the people here in person or online who don't understand our organization, we are headquartered in Nairobi all our lives in 65 years. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not more than 65 myself. So I've been in Amra for seven years, but it was founded in Kenya, headquartered in Nairobi, has offices globally, but they all report back to Nairobi where my, uh, where my office is and where I sit. But we work as an Africa-led, Africa-born organization. Well, uh, for us to do our work, we don't do it alone. We do it with global leaders. You know, I, we work with people like uh, Mantu from Canada. We work with people from India, Canada, you know, uh, Netherlands and wherever they may be. So we, it's important that we also understand that this is not anti-working together. This is actually pro-working together and enabling the, uh, remo the removal of barriers that actually stop us from working together. So this is not a, a, a you know, a kind of a, um, a polarization agenda. This is a unification agenda. Uh, well, to achieve this kind of working together, I'm going to make sure that we participate in all conversations everywhere, in Africa, in Asia, in America, in Europe, so that we ensure the community voices, solutions, and views of those we work with and uh, you know, who contribute to our general programming are represented on every conversation, which means that we have people from across our programs and our community members attending meetings wherever we are, we are convened. And this is not only staff. This includes community members. You know, we take community members who are fighting FGM and child marriage in their communities. We take community health workers. We take midwives and we go along with them because those are the people whose voices are really needed. So when we think about this issue, we must think of it this way. And I had that response from somebody who said, why are you complaining? And yet, look how many speakers we have from Africa. And, uh, you know, we, we say we are not looking at speakers. We are looking at people in the room, not only the speakers who are privileged like myself. I am privileged. I can say I'm African, but I must also recognize my privilege. I sit on top of a global organization. I have access to resources. I can speak, you know, I, what I like to, th to think is um, fluent English. We are talking about representation of people from all walks of life who are the people we, are, uh, we, are, we want to be represented. So the first point, therefore, to make is that this is not a north versus south dichotomy, and an, it's an agenda of inclusion where there is a shared objective with everybody, where everyone must be presented, including the communities with whom we work. I must tell you um, that uh, I can't blame the people who reached out, and as, because as I said, it is like asking somebody, a man, to tell you about the challenges of being pregnant, and yet he's never been pregnant. So if he doesn't know, you can't blame them. It's just that they sit on a position of privilege and they don't understand the challenges of those with the lived experiences. So all convenience are important and are of good intention. That's the point we have to start from. They are of good intention. They are not of good practice as was documented and talked about a lot by, uh, uh, by Matthew, but they may start from good intention to find solutions to the global agenda of health and well-being for all and leaving no one behind. So the intention cannot be questioned because we cannot reach it to question it. But the practice is layered with privilege and therefore doesn't deliver the intention in the way it is meant to be. The challenge, therefore, as an individual, as an organization, is that this good intention has been blind to inclusivity barriers that are meted through multiple dimensions. And those dimensions include but are not limited to costs of access, time, uh, racism, income, language, 
visa discrimination, all those dimensions are the ones that have diluted any single in good intention that we may carry out our global health activities with. AMRAF has made great effort to ensure we are present at this at huge cost, but also we determined that to offer an alternative, because I've had many people reach to me on, on Twitter and say, why don't you create your own platforms? Why are you going to these global ones? Create your own. It's not as simple as that. It is a global inclusive uh, message. It's not about saying, therefore, Africa will create its own and we don't care about the other. It's about creating African platforms in addition to opening the doors, the rooms, the windows of any other convening by ensuring that it is inclusive. So we have our own conference, which is called the Africa Health Agenda International Conference, which is deliberately led and convened in Africa every two years. And it has been extremely successful as well. And we, in, we also hold it in countries where we know that we can actually assure of visa access. And therefore we have held it in Kenya, in Kigali. Does it mean that all African countries have easy visa access? No. And there have been call outs, even in this forum now I've been watching on Twitter, saying we must also talk about discrimination of visa in African countries, in low income countries. We must call out those as well as we call out the visa discrimination in high income countries. But why is all this important? This is important because to use the 8020 rule, and this is why it's important to, to AMREF, and allow me to kind of elaborate on this. I know I might take a little more time than the UMB side, but this is really important. Global health is a global agenda, but 80% of the change we wish to achieve in the global agenda, in the SDG targets, is actually in Africa. So it's for Africa by African people. And so it makes sense for this to be discussed with them in the room and by them while still holding the principles that because the Africans want to do things themselves doesn't mean they do them alone, which is what I'm saying. It's not about a polarization agenda. It's about an inclusive agenda. It is in Africa where only 43% of the population has access to essential health services. It is in Africa where the biggest gap on health workforce is. It is in Africa where the highest fertility rate is. It is in Africa where 80% of preventable mortality happens. It's in Africa where the lowest core capacity for international health regulations, for global health security agenda is lowest. And it's in Africa where the lowest vaccine for public health emergency success is. I don't have to repeat that because Matthew spent a lot of time on this. But then also, why is black important in this conversation? Because it is also a minority conversation. For many of us, we don't realize that Black is actually a minority. We only represent 15% of the entire population as Black people. So we are actually a minority group, and over 90% of that minority group is in Africa. So in a way, you can say that this conversation is about Black people, and therefore, if there is a color inequity because of the minority nature of the Black people, and also because Africa is actually where this minority community exists. It therefore makes sense, therefore, that conversations on drastic change in global health for equitable access should happen most proximal to where the Black people are, the majority of the inequity is, and that is predominantly in Africa. I would like to postulate, without evidence, I must admit, and maybe Matthew has more evidence on this, that a significant number of the people who attend, speak at these global health meetings and contribute as experts have never been to Africa. I would take that to the bank, but I would need evidence to bank my bank account. In a nutshell, therefore, we either have the conversations where these people are or take the people to where the conversations are, which then brings us back to what started this conversation, the anti-Black immigration policies, which all of us, including myself, have suffered. Well, the majority of African countries avail visa on arrival, not all of them, so we must not make this an African solution, we must make this as a visa access solution. Where the majority of the African countries avail visa on arrival or online at approximately $50 major, or zero, majority of American and European visas require in-person interviews booked in advance on a calendar and appointments delayed up to more than a year. When I was going to the UN General Assembly in September, my visa of five years for the US had expired. I applied for a visa. I was given an April 2024 date for my, for, my, for my UNGA 2022 attendance. And it took an extraordinary amount of cajoling, begging the U.S. Embassy for my visa to be brought forward. Did that apply to 
community members we need to go along with, my own colleagues in AMREF who needed to go, many did not attend, and they were actually hosting events, uh, you know, out there in New York. The second point to talk about is that other than the appointments, the costs, including confiscation of your passport, meaning that until your passport comes back, and this is refers to UK, Schengen visas, you, you cannot travel until you get a visa back, and for you to be allowed to get your visa back. The UK has a kind, in quotes, policy that allows you to pay $80 so that you can retain your passport. Can you imagine, in addition to charging you $1,000 for your five-year visa, they require you to pay $80 to be allowed to carry your visa so they don't hold it for six weeks so that you cannot travel to other countries where you need to go to. In addition, they also charge you a fee for the transaction of getting your visa processed. So you can imagine the cost. In addition to this cost is travel. Never mind the time you have to wake up. I remember at a time when Africa I think we froze a bit. Uh, uh, maybe the team can try to bring uh, Dr. Yuan back on. Uh, but those are very explosive issues. For example, uh, we, we don't appreciate that it is the community members who need to participate. It's not the privileged who have gone to school. It's not the privileged who have the ability to go, but also the community members that actually we are trying to reach out to. And, and Dr. Yuan has just told us about 80% of global health challenges are actually in Africa. And, and uh, we also heard from um, uh, Professor Madu about 80% of the resources going to global um, um, universities and global agencies to be now then programmed for, for, for Africa. Yet you see the inequality and the skewedness of this. So maybe I could just uh, uh, bring in uh, uh, MC, as, as, as you so, said, it should be called. Yeah. Sorry, okay. let, me, let me just finish. I was discriminated against by technology, and uh, these are the challenges <laughs> even when we are told. Even when we okay. are told, please thank attend you. by Zoom. So I have just one more minute, and then I, I, I stop. Yeah? Okay. So thank you very much. Yeah, but... so, so imagine that what that 1,500 means of our economy ticket. It means 100%. Dr. we lost you again. Can you hear us? I think, I think we, technology is still giving us challenges there. So MC, as a young medic, uh, what are some of the challenges that uh, you and maybe your peers have experienced when they want to participate uh, in these global discussions? Um, thank you so much. This is a very loaded um, question. I'll answer it using a phrase my friend said on Twitter, because I think it's the best way to put it. She put it as we, when you start off, especially those of us who are exposed to global organizations, the message you're told is act local, think global, whatever you do in Kenya will be amplified and will stand and mean something. But when you're trying to get the opportunity to present in a global forum, you end up feeling like a second rate human. That is the term she used and it's true. And I think I'll give one experience that's still, uh, it's my biggest scar to date. Um, in 2018, we had a international forum for students and the visa centers for this forum were only three in Africa, Nairobi, Lagos and South Africa. So for everyone in Sub-Saharan Africa, your passport had to get to any of these stations. Now, for everyone in East Africa, now they had to DHL their passports to Nairobi. The visa place is in Runda. So when you're a student and you're thinking of how to commute to this visa embassy, you can't use a Matatu because you'll end up almost using triple the time to walk from the bus stop to where this visa embassy is. So you use an Uber back and forth. And I was ahead of the delegation for Kenya. So I was also given the passports for the Uganda, Tanzania, and Rwanda um, passports. So in total, I had about 15 passports to take to this visa place. And of course, they are coming at different times. Out of 15 passports, only one passport got a visa. And it was a Tanzanian. Until today, we don't know what was so unique. So that, since I had taken the Kenyan passports the first time, when I was given all of them back, I was like, oh, you mean all of us were approved? Then they were like, 
madam, just op open your passport and just confirm whether there's anything because <laughs> they were just opened and closed. So you can imagine going through 10 Kenyan passports, none of them have a visa. So when we appealed with the hosting country, they told us, maybe you guys don't know how to apply for a visa. So, and since we had applied first because we knew the embassies in our country, we waited and like one week to the conference, it turned out majority of the uh, developing countries, if I can put it that way, had the same fit. And when you ask how is it that all of us are having this problem, the same carrot is being dangled, maybe something was off, maybe. So we were like, fine, no problem. So the next conference, unfortunately, was in Prof Pai's backyard, Canada. And same script repeated itself. So now this time we were like, you guys, you have to be serious. A whole year, developing countries, majority being African, have gotten rejections, have had to use all these fees and your students to apply for the visa and then be told, no, you can't go. And most of these rejections are happening week of conference. So you have no way out. Some even got their passports two weeks after the event. And you're now there feeling, as my friend put it, like a second rate human because you've done this amazing work you want to showcase. And this is what is being responded. Ironically, COVID happened. One of the things we pushed for was you stream the event. And at the time, people are not understanding the rationale. But COVID happened, and now they had no choice but to stream the event. And fortunately or unfortunately, it helped, but not enough, because now you realize even where you would like to stream, there's someone who has internet access, there's someone who has a lecture to get to, there's someone who it's still not enough, even with the solutions that you put. And the saddest part is, if today, I'm even sure if I ask people in this room, if today I was to ask um, anyone from, let's say, Africa, do you consider yourself uh, having expertise in global health? They're more likely to say no, despite everything that they have done, just because we are made to, it's, it's indirectly put into our system that the Global North have a better system. And someone from the Global North will most likely say, they are an expert more easily without setting foot in the place where you really actually have to say you're a global health expert. And you ask yourself, what, what has gone wrong? What, is it still worth being in this rabbit race of saying you're in global health when the system is frustrating you at every point? Um, thank you. Thank you. Maybe, uh, can I just, um, yeah. Can I just amplify uh, Marie Claire's last point? I once was at a WHO meeting. I met some somebody who was also at the WHO meeting on the same expert committee. Uh, and I said, uh, she said, I'm with the Ministry of Health in South Africa, Department of Health. Um, and, and she asked me, so what do you do? Well, well, I do global health and I teach global health in, in Canada. I said, oh, global health, is that when young people from US or UK come to us and tell us how to run our health ministry. I'm like, ouch. <laughs> this is exactly how it has seen that uh, students, even you know, relatively young trainees, medical students, genuinely feel that they know more about some of the problems than you do here. And the asymmetry is so much that they can decide tomorrow morning to come here and then people with deep expertise who've spent years on the ground here will never get those opportunities to share their thoughts. And this is the, this is the most worrisome aspect of global health. The asymmetry is there even at the training stage. And it's no surprise that when they become professors or whatever, they carry that same mindset into global health. Thank you so much. I mean, that's quite deep. Uh, maybe uh, Dr. Samwati. What has been your experience and, and, and what do people tell you on your side hassles? <laughs> uh, thank you, Patterson. Um, so uh, I only dwell on my experiences. It's quite it's, uh, similar to, to MCs, um, but I, I'll, I'll dwell on, on, on something I want to preempt. Um, invariably, when I'm in conversations like this, somebody in the audience, a black person, an African, would always stand up and invariably um, almost rubbish what we are trying to do with this whole agenda of decolonizing global health or anti-blackness in global health, et cetera. 
Um, and uh, uh, it, it's, it's problematic. I remember when uh, Dr. Gitinji uh, posted about these visa um, issues, uh, I responded with an African saying that you cannot shave a man's head in his absence. Uh, and I was trying to make a point that maybe it's time for us to start boycotting some of these events. But for that to be effective, we need a critical mass of people. We need solidarity amongst ourselves to begin with, for us to begin to challenge some of these harmful practices. But then there are people who are either sitting on the fence amongst us or who are openly even hostile or antagonistic. Uh, and I want to address those people, uh, whether you're online or you're here today. Um, and the reason I want to do that, like I said, we need a critical mass of people. And so I've tried to understand what is their logic? What, what is shaping their perspective? Why are they almost antagonizing something that will ultimately benefit them if we achieve in what we're trying to do? And it, it, it boils down to two, uh, I'll call it uh, paradigms. First of all, there are those that say beggars don't have choices. And we as Africans, we always beg. When there was HIV, we're begging for ARVs. When there's vaccines, COVID, we are begging. We are always begging. And so beggars should not have any choice. We should not have any say. Whatever the West gives us, we take it. Whatever shape it or forms it comes, we accept it the way it is. Now, if this was just, you know, if global health was maybe a capitalistic business enterprise, maybe it's fine. You know, if you're at the bottom of the food chain, too bad for you. It's capitalism. That's that's how it works. But global health, at the essence of the essence of global health is equity, right? So global health to me is not a luxury. It's a right. And if it's a right, then the African beggar, right, must have the same value as the American billionaire. See what I did there? <laughs> see what I did there? You must have, you must see yourself as equal. And you must demand that, that equity, right? You shouldn't allow anybody to talk you down. But even take aside the moral imperative or the ethical imperative, there's a tactical imperative to being seen as equals. Because as we've seen from COVID-19 and other global health issues, one person's problem can easily become the problem for everyone. <laughs> one small village can shut down an entire, the entire world, right? And so from a tactical perspective, it makes sense that we are all at the table and that we all have equal say at that table, right? So don't lie to yourself that we are beggars and so we don't have a choice. As far as global health is concerned, there's a moral imperative, there's an, a tactical imperative that we must have a choice and that we must be at the table. Now, the second thinking that these people have is that, you know, um, charity begins at home, that we need to get our, pardon my French, in order, get our ish together, right? That, you know, our, our politicians are corrupt, our global health, our, our health system, they're not investing. In fact, during COVID, there are people that became billionaires from opaque and uh, corrupt procurement processes, right? In this very continent, people are dying. So what are we busy shouting about decolonizing and decolonization when we ourselves are our own worst uh, um, enemies, right? And fair enough, that's a fair argument. I think we must hold our leaders uh, accountable, but it's not mutually exclusive. What makes it a mutually exclusive conversation? Why can't we call out the imbalances in global health and still hold uh, leaders accountable. And I, I like to use this analogy, it's a bad one, but, but bear with me. Like if, if you're in, uh, suffering uh, um, abuse at home from your partner and your boss is sexually harassing you, I mean, it's absurd for anyone to tell you that you should only handle what is happening in, the, in your home past before you speak about what's happening in the office. It's absurd. You know, abuse is abuse regardless of where it's happening, right? So there's no mutual ex exclusivity to have talking about both issues. But also, let me traumatize you a little bit more. Just a little bit, bear with me. Who even told you that if we got our acts together, that things would be different globally? Who even told you that? Think about it. When uh, COVID vaccines were being shared, which country in Africa has its acts together? Let's say Botswana, good democracy, strong economy, et cetera. Were they called to the table by the wealthy countries? Did they call them and say, Hey, you, you have good democracy. You've got your, st your stuff together. Come, let's hold these vaccines together. Forget about those corrupt Africans. 
No, they were also at the back of the queue. They were not at the table. They were also at the back of the queue with the rest of us corrupt people. So, <laughs> isn't it? So, so who says that getting your, your business together is even going to change anything? Not that we shouldn't, but that should not be a reason why you don't become part uh, of this conversation. And, and lastly, if, if you're thinking that by sitting on the fence or by not being vocal or by even being antagonistic, that is going to shield you from what is going on, then I have a news flash for you, right? Once you get to that border, once you get to that embassy, nobody's going to ask you, do you believe in decolonization or not? <laughs> nobody, no one. You're going to get to that border, they're going to look at your skin and they're going to judge you unworthy of being there, full stop. <laughs> So you might as well cross over to the dark side. <laughs> you, might as well, you might as well cross over to the dark side. Uh, and I'll leave you with a, with, a pro, with a saying, you know, where I come from, you say, if you must eat a frog, eat the biggest one, eat the fattest one. Frogs are hideous. So if you must eat a frog, eat the, most, eat the biggest one you can find. So if we're going to do this issue of, of decolonizing global health, I'm asking you, come join us and eat this massive frog and let's destroy it this anti-blackness in global health. Thank you, thank you. Wow, if you have to eat the frog, you look for the biggest one. Uh, I can see uh, MC wants to make a comment. Then uh, Florence, let me know if there are any uh, questions online. And then I'll yes. after that we can ask uh, Professor to, yeah. And you'll allow me to make my last comment uh, when you're ready. I'm back online, thank you. Oh, okay. Ah, you can go then uh, so that we don't lose you again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually being seriously discriminated by uh, Global North Wi-Fi, by the way. So I'm actually on Kenyan uh, data. So um, the first one I want to make from the last uh, comment uh, is that corruption has no race, no color, no passport. It happens everywhere. And I think just like the language of hesitancy that was talked about earlier, the language of corrupt Africans actually is used to divert us from the real discriminatory issue. We know that COVID millionaires happened even though actually COVID billionaires in, in uh, pound billionaires in the UK, there were dollar billionaires in the US, there were rand billionaires in South Africa. So it happens everywhere and uh, it's, it's the diversionary. So I agree that uh, we should not listen to that as a reason why we must not be included. The, I want to just leave uh, three issues here. We need to do three things. One, we need to call out for an examination of privilege in everyone who is hosting any meeting, people, and including ourselves, we have to call out privilege, examine our privilege, understand it, and call it out. Secondly, understanding the privilege then requires us to give up our power. We have to give up our power to ensure that it is those closest to the issue that must be participating in the issue. And that means that um, we give up our privileges of travel comfort of traveling only two hours in Europe and having to travel eight hours to Africa. We have to give up those privileges, give up the power to those closest to the issue. And finally, we must accept, and this is a point that was made by the last speaker, we must accept that this is now the new global health burning platform. Shift the conversations most proximal, proximal to the people who are involved or commit significant resources to take them to where the issue is. But the easiest is take the conversation to where the people are. I extend an invitation to all of you to CIFIA in December, which is hosted by Africa CDC, and to Africa Health Agenda in March in Kigali, which is hosted by Amnesty Health Africa. Thank you for allowing me to make my comments. Thank you so much. And thank you for your patience also and being able to join. So maybe before we go to the audience questions, uh, MC Dakari had a comment. Uh, yes, I did. I think. As we also talk about decolonizing global health, I think one key thing we need to, and I'd like to amplify what Prof Pai said on allyship. Um, for those of us who look into the mirror and see this as a problem, there's only such limited scope your voice will have. And sometimes it's coming on board, like the people, of, those of you who've logged into Zoom, those of you who are here in person, who probably understand this challenge or who are trying to learn more of this challenge, that is the first step that it takes, that it's not more than just those ones affected, but also those ones who see it as a problem to sort of shine a light and help us bridge this gap together. 
Um, and one of the key things I think which is happening and, and acknowledge is um, we have amongst ourselves young people who are coming together to share insights on challenges, but not just challenges, but also solutions on how we can do this better. Um, Professor Pai wrote a wonderful article that had different, all of us who have the same story, but different contexts. Um, I have colleagues who we, we reviewed almost 700 uh, journals on public health, and we saw like 2.5% of people who are edit collectively, editors, editors in chief, are from low middle income, low income countries and women out of 700 journals. You can imagine how small that is. Um, and it took all of us coming together and someone saying, yes, I'm from Netherlands, but I see this is a challenge. Um, you're from Kenya, what do you think the challenge is? And some of the challenges you'll be, you'll just highlight and be like, for you probably it's easier for you to table this argument. For me, it might be seen as maybe aggression or anger. Um, but how can both of us with our contrasting views come together to give tangible solutions? Because the solutions have to be there when both the people who are affected and the people who are on the fence and the people who probably support all come on board so as to just bridge that gap even faster. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, Professor. I want to react to, uh, to Sam. So Sam, I've heard what you've said said to me many times when I talk about this is, oh, but then Africa is, is so, uh, the governance is poor, so much corruption. So even if you did this, nothing is going to work, right? What would we say about United States under Donald Trump? What would we say about UK right now? Such levels of dysfunctionality in countries that see themselves as world leaders, right? But nobody would even talk about that, right? It's like the stigma attached to Africa is so deep-rooted that even when some of the richest nations in the world are literally failing miserably on all forms of equity and governance, and yet there is no acknowledgement, even acknowledgement of that, right? And, um, and the anti-Blackness, I forgot to mention that, and I think I should set the record say, anti-Blackness is very real about Africa. There's no doubt about that. But anti-Blackness is also found in the richest nations in the world. Take the United States. A Black mom in America has a three times higher risk of dying during childbirth and pregnancy. How do you explain that in the richest country in the world? Right? So anti-blackness happens in every place there is, and it is particularly bad against Africans, but even within the richest nations, there's anti-blackness. So those of us who work in global health equity, but who are based in the global north, sometimes should also address internal inequities within our own countries, right? It seems much easier to fly off and save someone in an African country, quote unquote, and not address serious problems within Canada, we have serious disparities. Our indigenous populations have been left behind and, and settler colonialism has devastated them. And we don't see that as global health, but we are ready to come here and do something, right? So I think those of us who are in high income countries must have the humility to say that we are not doing well ourselves. Then how do we become leaders in other parts of the world, right? That humility I find and reflexivity is completely absent in many of the conversations that happen. It's automatic that if you're high income, you got it right, you have all the answers, you know what to do. US and UK have done miserably with the COVID pandemic. So what gives them the moral authority? United States is the one of the richest countries with zero universal health coverage, right? Gun violence, million problems to solve, and yet we feel like we know the answers for the rest of the world. How, how does that reflexivity not come into our discussion? Right? There's virtually no open discussion. But you mention Africa, then immediately, oh, there's corruption. There's you know, no ability to do, deal with it. Right? That has become then an excuse. Like vaccine hesitancy became an excuse for rich countries to vote. Yeah. Oh, even if we give Africa, they don't know what to do with it. Yeah. They're hesitant. They have no cold chain whole slew of excuses to dismantle any equity at all, right? So it almost becomes weaponized against you. And this happens every single time, right? 
Thank you. I think you ended mm -hmm. it quite well. We've actually weaponized it against um, uh, Black um, communities, whether they are in the US or they're in Africa. I would want to really get some uh, engagements from the uh, the audience uh, virtually. So I uh, I have seen a question there, but maybe let me start uh, Florence with any questions that are online and just direct them straight to wherever that question has been asked to. Thank you. So we have a question from Ziraba and he's asking, is global health inequality? Yeah, so we have a question from Ziraba and he asks, Dr. Ziraba, he asks, is global health inequity about skin color or poverty? And another question, um, another, uh, another question is, as we call, as we call out um, the West to account, as we call to the West to account, what do we need to tell our own leaders whose priorities are often misplaced? Yeah. Um, so that I think it's just to anyone on the panel. And then the other, we have other, we have other 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 suggestions on the on the on the chat. Um, someone's asking about having tangible solutions. What are the tangible solutions that we can we can come up with together? And this is the whole purpose of this uh, of this of this conversation. And then Patricia is asking, how do we get rid of the unspoken undertones of the use of terms such as global north and glo versus global south? Okay. So those are just some of the few things that are coming out of the conversation. So maybe you can take the first one. Yeah. You, you could to take the first one and then um, 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 MC could talk about the global north and south and then uh, Prof, you could uh, talk about uh, allies because that's also a question that has been brought there. Yeah, so uh, again, I, I was right. Somebody was going to ask about us holding our leaders accountable. And again, my, my response is the same. They are not, it's not a mutually exclusive conversation. We should and must hold our leaders accountable, but at the same time, we must agitate for reform of the global health landscape and architecture. Um, and then in terms of whether global health is about poverty or about skin color, um, we are talking about anti-blackness today, right? And so we are talking, I mean, think about it. Um, the, the director of Africa CDC, he, he was discriminated against on his way to a conference on global health in Berlin. Is he a poor man? I don't think so. Where does poverty come to play? <laughs> Where does poverty come into that? The executive director of UNAIDS was on her way to a conference on AIDS. <laughs> Same mistreatment. What has poverty got to do with that? Yes, of course, as global health, our mission, our mandate, I think, is to address uh, social determinants of health and poverty is, is included in that. But what we are talking about today is different. We are talking about anti blackness, and I don't see where poverty comes in. Okay. Dr. Tari, you can talk to us about the narrative about the North and the South. Uh, thank you. That's, it's, it's a tough question because, let's face it, if you're looking at the history of how global health started, global health was. Primarily, it's a section of public health that was predominantly started in the West and then trickled down to, or rather started in the North and then trickled down to the South. So with that, and if you can look at institutions that offer, let's say, Masters in Global Health or any Global Health affiliated course, I think they're close to, if I, I stand corrected, but they're close to 80% of the institutions are all based in the global north as opposed to the global south. Does that mean that this 20% uh, in the global south are offering an inferior course? No, it might even be that they're offering a more hands-on course because you'll find many a times those ones that offer courses in the global north have an element of a practicum where they have to touch on a global south problem. But just because of how the foundations of global health were set up, you end up having those disparities, not because it was intended that way, but just because of how the systems were put in place. Um, and it will also, I'll also give you a different context to think about it. If you're, I'll give it from my perspective as a medical student, in medical school, we were told to be the next netters, the next hypocrites. We were rarely told to be the next emotive. 
yet Imhotep was the first doctor and he was from Egypt. And it's just how the basis of training has been and the basis has, that's how the foundations are, that you, you know that the West have superior technology, superior knowledge, and hence you doubt the quality of the knowledge you have today in your country. Um, I have asked so many of my mentees, if you are to do a master's in public health, where do you want to do it? And they'll most commonly jump to a developed country than even their alma mater, just because they believe that is where the most superior knowledge is. Yet you might find having even your master's of public health from, I was in University of Nairobi, from University of Nairobi, it might empower me more to make the changes in my health system, which is what I want to do, than having a master's of public health, say in a top Ivy League university. But we never think of it that way. So unfortunately, it's a system that's been set up that way. And it's having conversations like this, it's having realizations like this that make us see how we can bridge that gap. Thank you. I think some of these conversations mm -hmm. are the ones that will help us uh, dismantle structures that have consistently worked against um, uh, the South. Um, uh, Prof, there was a, a question about some uh, practical solutions that we could um, adopt. I think um, in terms of conferences and events and panels, most obvious solution I can think of is if we're going to organize something, ask the simple question, for this particular content, who is the most impacted person or community? If they have no chance of getting into that meeting, what is the point of that meeting? It's as simple as that. If an African delegate can't speak at an AIDS conference, of what use is that AIDS conference? And, and we are not learning. Next year's AIDS conference is supposed to be in Australia, for Christ's sakes. I can't even imagine what it would take for a Kenyan to get an Australian visa oh, right. in this crisis. <laughs> so we, are, we are sleepwalking through these disasters and we're not waking up. I'm, I'm not getting it. If you really care about AIDS, you should care about the most influential, impactful people. And if they are not on the stage, what is the point? Right? What's the point of having a malaria conference in Switzerland for Christ's sakes? When has Switzerland seen malaria? I mean, this is bonkers. At some point, we've got yep. to wake up and yep. understand what on earth are we doing as a community? And why is it that people in high-income countries are simply not waking up to such basic things that even my 14-year-old can tell that there's something wrong with this picture, right? And my only uh, answer or explanation is they're fully aware, but they don't care. You really think people yep. in running conferences don't know that Africa is the most impacted communities. They know, but the structures are such that we perennially do the same thing and hope for a better outcome. Yeah. Right? We we'll make the same mistakes and we hope for a better outcome and we will never change. I believe next year's Tropical Diseases Conference will be in Chicago. I mean, this just continues on and on and on. There's no awakening in, yeah. the, in the field. And so the voices that really would, matter. I would like to comment on this. Yes, please. Can, can you hear me? This, this is Dr. Gidinjan. Thanks, thanks uh, Prof, for highlighting that. The issue is that the global health community does not recognize lived voices, lived experiences. They pay more attention to what they refer to as qualitative, quantitative peer-reviewed data. And, they, and as was presented by Prof before, this is largely a northern, uh, uh, northern owned property. So the question is, what is the role of people with lived experiences? And how do we elevate experiences above, qualitative, uh, above quantitative data that is collected by institutions that are largely in the global north? So we're talking about people who are living with HIV need to be in the room to say, these are experiences. You can make your medicines, but if I don't take them, they don't make a change. They don't make a difference. And the reason I'm not taking them is because of I need to breastfeed my child. I need to do the following. I need to go to the shamba. I can't take vaccines because I am informal. I can't go to the clinic because my, my vegetables are sold during the day when your clinic is open. So your vaccines are useless to me because I need to earn a daily wage. These lived experiences are critically important. 
and we must elevate we must elevate them the second point to make is what can we do in this particular instance and this is why i talked about jesse bump reaching out to me earlier a professor of uh, harvard universities we went out to the agm to the annual general meeting or health systems global because the one thing we must make in this conference that we are not devalidating or invalidating the importance of our colleagues everywhere in the world you know, Professor Matthew is sitting here from Canada, so we are not invalidating the knowledge and the interest and the intention of our colleagues anywhere in the world. The question is, how do we shift their structures to be responsive to this conversation? So we went to the Health System Global AGM and we proposed a resolution that all future Health System Global meetings will be held in the Global South unless there's a significant reason, in which case the AGM must provide processes for attendance and for removal of barriers of visa discrimination. We put that in AGM, which is happening on Wednesday, and I hope the AGM listens and adopts that resolution. So we need to take actual practical steps to shift the paradigm, and we have to be uncomfortable in doing so. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ari. We have to indeed be uncomfortable. Uh, there was a question from uh, Dr. Ono, um, and then another one behind there. So we could take those two questions and then come back to the panel. Wonderful. Yeah, thanks. Um, my name is Dr. Rono, and it's a privilege to be here. Um, so maybe three comments. One is just to echo the voice of um, the panelists. I think one of the most striking things during the COVID pandemic was the same week that the Omicron variant was announced or was, you know, you know, declared in South Africa and flights out of South Africa, South Africa were cancelled. Was probably the same week that you know vaccines were being shipped out of a manufacturing plant in South Africa to Europe, which was just uh, absurd. And um, I think so. I'm just uh, you know adding my voice to this conversation. I think we cannot afford to sit on the on the fence any longer. The second comment is that I think, in my view, the the visa situation is is such a visible thing and it comes to the fore in this conversation. But I think it's more or less you know, just a signal of something much more fundamental, that there's some, you know, unique, there's greater iniquity, whether it's in funding, in, in the way research is structured. Are we talking about having co-authors, co for instance, are we having collaborators, or are we having contributors to papers? I mean, are we, are we using different terms to mean totally different things um, about, you know, partnerships and collaborations, even in research, or even in funding and investments in health? And then um, one last point that I want to make, and this is really a challenge to myself and police, several of us in this room who are in, in a position where, in a context where we talk about global north and global south, I think there's a missing piece in between there that has been called different names. I think the name that I, I associate strongly is the name double agents, where you're not really in the global south, you're not really in the global north, you're somewhere in the middle. And I think I, I find myself in that situation a couple of times where you're I'm Kenyan, I'm African, I do a lot of work in Africa. 80% of my work is here. But I'm in conversations where I'm supposed to represent Africa or represent my partners or clients in Europe. And my allegiance is you know, going back and forth on who do I, where, where does my heart really belong to? And I think it's really a challenge to all of us in that space because we probably have, as like Dr. Dinji mentioned, we are the more privileged ones who are in those conversations, but we are the ones who should actually call out our own conflict and say, you know, actually, I need to speak for what is right, even where it's not necessarily in my favor. Thanks. Thank you. Indeed, the double agent um, is something that we have to look at because also it means about the source of resources and, and, and who is giving you the brief to do your work. Thank you. Yeah, we have can have the last question from there. Thank you very much. My name is Boniface. Um, uh, let me first of all say that the time for this conversation is very short. This is a conversation that can go on for a week. We can still have things to say. There are many things that you've highlighted here that are of interest. First of all, we talked about the global north and the global south. But discussion has been ongoing. We wanted to move it to Africa. We realize, often we write sub-Sahara Africa. Is there any Africa under the Sahara? I don't know. So I think maybe that blindness that you talk about is actually coming to play here. We are even our terminologies 
we have removed all the predominantly black Africa. We put them one side and we call them sub-Saharan Africa. And then the other Africa, I don't know what we call them. So whether the Africans or not, because their skin color is a different shade from our own. So there are many things to discuss there. But I did want to, to touch on a point that Dr. Dr. Sam uh, mentioned. That point is of interest to me because it seems to me that Sam was trying to preempt the room or make sure that there's no opposing view on no critical questions asked about our African leaders. Listen, I'm a Nigerian. As a Nigerian to travel within Africa, it's as difficult as even traveling to Europe. I went to Liberia, which is in West Africa. I don't need a visa to get to Liberia. I went with Kenyan colleagues. The people from Kenya were let into Liberia before me. And I'm in Nigeria, I'm West Africa. So if we start to think about the global north versus the global south, or whiteness versus blackness, what is black in for black? I mean, let's be open, let's be honest. If you are a black Kenya in South Africa, you are endangered. In fact, if you are a Nigerian in South Africa, you have to be washing your shoulder at every single time. So we talk, and, and, and Sam, you preempt me from asking about Africans. I work here at APHRC. We have several projects that we do. I can say, is there any colleague sitting here from APHRC or online whose project is funded by an African organization? or an African institution, our money comes from the global north to do our research. And it's not just in global health, it's in education, it's in agriculture, it is in biology, it is in everything. So I like the conversation about decolonizing global health, but can we question ourselves in-house? Do we even have Africa? Because in Africa, Egypt doesn't see itself as Africa. Tunisia is not Africa. South Africa is a, is a wall of its own. <laughs> so we are, what are we talking about here? How, when will we question ourselves? Then, you see all these studies that we are doing, the studies that you are doing, have a collaborator in the global north. Oh, you, you talked about Syria conference in Africa. Where, at the London Institute of what do they call it? The Global uh, you know, Tropical Medicine. We don't even have, we are in the tropics. We don't even have a tropical medicine university or institute here. The, the Global North controls everything. They give us funding for our studies. In fact, we are beggars. In my country, in my, in my village where I come from in Nigeria, we have a, 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 a proverb, a saying, it's crude, and forgive me, I'm going to say it. I I'm at APHRC, I work on sexual and reproductive health. So I don't feel sexual things are not too heavy for me to say. We say in my village that begging alters the shape of the vagina. If you are standing straight, you are not begging, your vagina is correct. If you bend your knee, it alters the shape of your vagina. We are beggars. If we don't want to, to be treated badly in other countries or in the global norm, we as Africans need to address ourselves. You can't even travel within Africa. What do you think you, what do you, think you will expect when you go beyond Africa? So when you discuss this, please put solutions. Like that last, the question from Ziraba on the, on, on, from online, what are the solutions? I'm not talking about a thing, discussing it, it's also a way of acknowledging that the problem exists and the solution can come from there. But as we sit now, what are the solutions? Yeah. We, know, we know that the, the African CDC director was rejected. Uh, I mean, he was maltreated going to, to Germany. But we are maltreated here in Africa, in, in Malawi. I mean, I mean, Nigeria has over 200 million, a very large country who should respect us in Africa. <laughs> but everywhere I go, even in Kenya, where I live, 
My friend, there are Nigerians that disappear in Kenya every, sorry to say, Nigerians disappear in Kenya. I go out on a certain day, I wear my Nigerian JC. I'm driving my APA Sharusi issued uh, license plate, which says that I'm a diplomat in Kenya. And because I'm wearing my Nigerian JC, people harass me. So how do we address it from our own house before we go out? That's Thank you so much. My, that's my question. Thank you. I think you bring, you bring up very serious and pertinent issues. And actually, um, we can all be here and talk about this thing for a long time. And I think it gives us a very good opportunity to see how well do we take it forward. And um, I want to, because we, we have actually run out of time, I would want to sort of uh, give the panel um, uh, 30 seconds each uh, to sort of uh, give us their closing uh, remarks as we wait for uh, Dr. Evelyn to come and uh, wrap this up for us. Thank you so much. Uh, we could start next week. Yes. Yeah. Yes, no, thank you for this opportunity. And, and again, I want to say the conversations must not be mutually exclusive. And, and in every social injustice movement, you find this. When, when women are talking about gender equality, women's rights, there are women that will stand up and say, well, women are their own worst enemy. No, you don't say that. Yes, there might be women that are their own worst enemy, but that does not preclude a conversation about gender equality. When we started talking about Black Lives Matter, there are people that started saying, you know, there's so much black on black violence. So what are we talking about? If, if we as black people are killing ourselves, why should we be talking about black lives matter and police brutality? No, they are not mutually exclusive. We must speak up against both. So that's what I want to leave with you today. Don't fall into this trap of self-deprecation. Don't fall into that trap. We have issues everywhere has issues. No continent is perfect. No race is perfect. And so we should not accept our imperfection as a reason not to speak up against the injustices. Thank you. I think Dr. Sam has said fantastic words and you've brought another realm of this discussion, which is equally worth exploring. I mean, right now we have, if you're following the COP27 discussions, there are a couple of African advocates who are complaining how they still don't have their visas to go to Egypt. Um, myself, I've been held uh, at exiting Egypt because of a camel uh, carving I got um, <laughs> with three police officers telling me, camel, camel, camel in Arabic. And I'm like, yes, I have a camel in my backpack. And it took my Kenyan colleague who looked more Egyptian with a hijab to explain that, yes, it's a carry-on, it can be put in the baggage for me to get out of customs. Um, so it happens. And it's also a fact that if you're to travel from Nairobi to let's say Togo, where the WHO from meeting was, the ticket might be equivalent from here to maybe even Canada and back. I mean, those are infrastructural problems that we have. But the big question we should, we should also ask ourselves is which African millionaire, to go to billionaire, which African millionaire has contributed a few thousands to improving infrastructure, let's say even to Africa CPC. We are not investing in ourselves. So if your own people who have revenue are not investing in us, then how are we supposed to bridge this divide on the challenges of having one Africa? And that is why you'll have the challenge of, if I go to South Africa and I end up in one part, in part, part of South Africa, um, I'll be looked at like, I am, I'm, I'm a foreigner here, the same way you have said the same problem, the same way if someone goes to Egypt, someone from Egypt will be like, this is not Africa, this is probably EMR. But there are also Egyptians who, who are like, we want to be recognized as Africans, why aren't you recognizing us? So it starts with us, it starts with us recognizing that we are one continent, it doesn't matter. I mean, at the end of the day, it's one continent, it's really, if you've ever had a discussion of EMR and, and Africa, you'll find how it's such a complex discussion to have. And most of it comes to also what they have been told about Sub-Saharan Africa and how the nuances that they have been given. And when you try to bridge that gap and when we start accepting that we also need to invest in ourselves for us to be a better continent, then that's where we go. And is there anything we can do about it tangible? 
Um, I always say, as even Dr. Gidenji has said, the, the stories that we have, social change starts with one, being courageous to share your story, what has happened to you, and what you think a solution is. Back to my analogy I said at the start of the panel, for us to have fundamental change, you don't have to look at it from your reflection in the mirror, but what the reflection is looking back at someone else. That is how we can evoke change. And that is how with our stories, we can solve all the challenges that we face, not in silos, but in collection, because each challenge affects us in one way or the other. Thank you. Thank you. I think I want to begin by again appreciating um, all of you for giving me this opportunity because I could have just sat there and just listened to all of you and gone home learning a lot. I think my biggest anxiety that keeps me awake is whether it's the pandemic or whether it's climate crisis. I'm just not seeing all of us as people who genuinely believe we are in it together. I feel like, like this is a pattern we are seeing that we are somehow not able to land on this, that we are all human beings at the end of the day, right? But these two are existential crises, which cannot be solved by any individual country, right? Who, which one country can solve climate crisis or pandemics or these are massive transnational problems that genuinely require transnational collaboration on a scale never envisioned before, right? So at some level, this nationalism, populism, this skin color, language politics are making it impossible for us to work together as humankind. So my biggest challenge when I te teach my students in Canada is how do I tell them that they are global citizens? Yes, they have a Canadian passport or whatever. But beyond that, there is a second passport that they have that's invisible. But they see themselves as genuine global citizens. So rediscovering our global citizenship as humankind, I think is paramount if we have any hope of dealing with the climate crisis and emerging out of this mess that we've gotten ourselves into. The reality is far from global citizenship, right? We talk about global solidarity and citizenship, but we've not seen anything like that in actual practice. And that scares me a lot for the climate crisis, right? Already global North countries are seeing themselves as being protected and bunkered and walled off, that they're going to somehow weather the climate crisis and everybody else can go to hell. That level of thinking is absolutely pathological. And, and we have to ask if we can't see beyond color or geography or race or religion and come together as humankind, how do we ever solve massive problems like climate crisis? Thank you so much. Indeed, quite, um, uh, we have some work to do. Uh, thank you so much yep. for the panel. One, yeah, final yes, comment. Secretary. This yes, is what happens more... when you, you when you're not visible, you're not in the room, and this is what oh. exactly we are talking about. <laughs> so, so we have to be visible to be in the room. So let me say, so this, this digital thing doesn't work if we have to be in the room. So I'm just going to say in a final remark here that agreeing with all the other uh, colleagues, uh, thanking Professor. Uh, Pai for actually uh, reaching out and leading this and Catherine for hosting us and finally saying that we must shamelessly adopt this as a burning platform for the agenda we want to achieve for localization. The localization agenda has started to be talked about in funding. How do you get the money most proximal? And this is something that was talked about by the panelists. But now how do we localize our global health convenings and conferences and ensure that they are most proximal and most participatory but we have to do this shamelessly and we have to do this by actually taking sacrifices. Some of those sacrifices may mean other than creating this platform, deciding not to attend conferences that are discriminatory. That means we are making a sacrifice. This is what Amref did and saying in solidarity, we withdrew six people who are going to go to the health systems global meeting, hosting sessions, we just withdrew. We have to be un uncomfortable. We have to actually call out and we have to take action so that the organizers start to realize that this burning platform is a constant platform. So let us make it a constant platform. Let us discuss it at every conference. And I'm inviting you guys to actually join me in a similar conference. I would like to invite you, uh, Catherine and Professor Pai, to Kigali 6 to 8, and we host a, common, a similar anti-blackness in global health session uh, with people in the room in Kigali in March. 
Thank you very much, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. That's over to me. I'm really excited. It's been um, quite an interesting conversation. Um, uncomfortable but necessary conversations that need to keep happening. Um, because I've you know, been on Twitter a lot for many, many years, actually. <laughs> it's been interesting. I've been one of those who, who's always talked in Canada. And the person who's behind the desk is either white or black, but I always get to the side of the... I don't know why. I've never found out my uncle by that. We need to have an agenda of inclusion where everyone must be and where the communities we work in are always included. Um, Prof, uh, Dr. Gidinji talked to us about our position of privilege. Many of us here don't realize, but we are in that position of privilege. But how many of us reject the tokenism that gets thrown at us? I think we mentioned tokenism. Um, for many, many years, I think I've been in global health for 20 something odd years. I've been on a panel because I'm black, a woman, and at some point I was the young one, all right? <laughs> so you tick so many boxes <laughs> and you're always there and you accept it from a position of privilege because you think you're changing the narrative. We need to ask ourselves those uncomfortable questions. We need to offer an alternative, a global inclusive alternative. An African platform in addition to what is there. So we're not talking about um, taking away from what our Global North partners are doing. It's just to make sure that we have our own platforms so that when those other alternatives don't work for us, we have our own platforms. We are not um, looking to have Africans do it alone. It is about inclusiveness. Um, we are not looking for a polarized agenda but an inclusive agenda. Remember, and this is what I like from all of us, corruption has no race, color, or geography. This is just used to divert our attention from the anti-blackness of many of the agenda. We need to call out the privilege. We need to understand the privilege and give up our power. Those closest to the problem should be given that power. We need to shift the conversation and or take the conversation to where to those who matter most. Um, then you know, what he talked about beggars being never being choosers, right? You're given what it takes. How many of you have given beggars socks with holes in them and assume you've done a really good thing? That's not right. But global health is not a luxury, it's a right. You therefore, as Africans, as black people, you need to be mindful. It is equity. It is about um, a moral imperative that we must be at the table. Um, and then the last point is that um, we don't have to wait for our governments to get their house in order because it may not change. Um, the anti-blackness movement is not only led by white people. Um, how many of you in Kenya have gone to a restaurant where the black waiter looks at you and it goes to the white person in the room. Or when you come into immigration in Kenya, have you stood at the diplomatic line as a black person and been bypassed for the white person who probably doesn't even have a visa to be in the country, all right? And they get in the line and leave while you're waiting in that queue because they decided your black and your diplomatic passport doesn't really give you entry into the country as a true country, all right? Think about these things. And then lastly, I think the point about humble allies, we have many of them and they're here walking with us, talking with us, having the uncomfortable but necessary conversations. They continue to help us put together some structures that we can dismantle, ask the questions, you know, the conferences are being led by the white. So if those that are affected cannot come, our humble allies should just say, you know what, let's just cancel the conference. We are not invalidating our allies' voice. It's allyship to liberation. So all future global health meetings should be in the global South if there's no alternative. So I'll be in Kigali in March. And it has to have a localized agenda. Lastly, I want to thank all, all of these guys here. And it's really always exciting 
the token young black lady that sits <laughs> right now. <laughs> And the gentlemen around her, they've done such a good job. And I thank you for coming today. Thank you. Oh, and the one online who's surprisingly in London, <laughs> hopefully um, leading the agenda on colonization. Thank you, Dr. Kinji. And thank, thank you, you for very much, everyone. Thank you. And thank you to all our virtual participants. We have been with you and thank you so much. Um, and with that, I think we come to the end of our session today. We will make it a point to have similar discussions and uh, we will make a point to actually get you and invite you again. Thank you so much and have a great uh, evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good. Yeah,